Spark Plug Creations, media that sparks change. Quote, our relationship with our gut bacteria is very similar on a macro level to our relationship with our planet now. She was ready to cut me open. I'm like, whoa, you know, it was like, let's just slow this down here. You're not seeing stories of hope and perseverance. You're seeing stories of people suffering and dying. And This is no joke, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. People die, people lose their intestines, people have miserable lives. They also suffer horribly from the drugs they're given. And when those drugs didn't work, it put me over the edge. And I was like, first, I can't live like this. I'm not living. I don't have enough energy to engage with my family. I don't have enough energy to work, to climb a flight of stairs. I'm on the floor retching. What kind of life is this? The thought of living like that forever. Why would you want to? If there was a button that I could just press right now to just end this pain entirely that I would have pressed it at that point. And that button, what I'm referring to, is actually ending my life. We need to reconvene with Earth and Earth starts inside of us. Unquote. Dr. Pedram Sojai. There are three types of inflammatory bowel diseases. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and microscopic colitis. For the purposes of this documentary, Focus will be on Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, as the category of microscopic colitis is relatively new and less commonly diagnosed in patients. For many patients, conventional treatments do not work to bring relief. After years of suffering horribly, many courageous patients go against medical advice to use controversial alternative treatments. To find a cure to achieve better management of their IBD, or even to cope, is a massive struggle for patients. Part of the struggle is the disease being so complicated to treat. Another aspect is the enormous cost of the conventional treatments and their potentially risky side effects. Often, our political and medical systems directly impede patients' access to alternative treatments, even though many are cheaper, safer, and more effective than the conventional ones. I'm Reed Kimball, and I have Crohn's disease. I'm searching all over North America to find empowered patients who are doing well after saying no to the conventional path they have courageously chosen controversial alternative treatments. Despite medical professionals saying it's impossible, I hope to learn how to cure my Crohn's disease and then share my knowledge with you. People are suffering. They can't wait years for new treatment approaches. They need answers now. I believe those answers already exist and I intend to find them. My dreams and goals growing up were to play hockey in the National Hockey League. I started playing when I was seven years old and I fell in love with it. Um, I can remember one time in school, my science teacher wanted to talk to me after class and I told her that I needed to you know, go to hockey practice right after class. And she goes, Reed, what's a greater priority, science or hockey? <laughs> And I stood there and I didn't say anything and the whole class just laughed because they knew what my answer was. <laughs> we were doing a festival that happens every year at the end of the year where they put on like 12 productions in a very short amount of time, like two weeks. And I was doing a particularly challenging project of building this uh, like renaissance wedding gown. Um, I was working these really long hours and really stressed out and I remember getting my workout in and I would I have to get up in the middle because my stomach would start cramping and have to run to the bathroom. And so I started having these bouts of diarrhea and you know this was just a, a few weeks again I started seeing some blood in the toilet and then like tissue and I thought that doesn't look good and it really scared me and that's when I finally told my mom. Uh, and it eventually got to the point where I would eat and within 30 minutes have to go and vomit uh, and it, I, I couldn't keep it down. Uh, and that was when we decided, okay, daily vomiting is probably not good. We need to go see a doctor. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are rising in incidence worldwide. They are now seen in countries that didn't have any cases before the year 2000. In the United States, hospitalizations for IBD patients increased dramatically by 65% from 2000 to 2009. Finally, we went to see a gastroenterologist and he wrote up in um, my records, he thought there might be a possible connection between the Accutane and me developing colitis. So I had the colonoscopy February 13th, uh, 1997, 
and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease after they saw definite thickening of my uh, intestines, my small bowel, uh, the cobblestone appearance, I saw that clearly. Um, it was May 28th, 2004, and I was standing in the hallway with my mom and the doctor, and he told me, uh, you have uh, what looks like you have Crohn's disease, and I had never heard of it. The date, June 6, 2006, 666, I mean, it was just kind of, this, <laughs> you couldn't have picked a better date to be diagnosed with a chronic uh, disease. Over 1.6 million people in the United States are known to have an IBD. 233,000 Canadians have IBD. 261,000 in the United Kingdom. Roughly 2.2 million in the European Union. 70,000 in Japan. About 60,000 in Australia. And in China, about 31,200 people have IBD. Cases are also being seen in parts of the world where it was previously unheard of before, such as Iran and Africa. Both men and women are equally affected, and the average age of diagnosis is 15 to 35. There was an element of relief because I finally knew what was wrong with me. You know, one moment you're, you're healthy and the next moment it's like you've got this news and this is just really freaking me out. You know, I'm thinking like, what is this whole for my future with my kids? I, you know, I want kids and I want a family, I want a husband. And so it was really scary. And um, I just remember like the room just started to go black. Like I started, like everything just started closing in and I just started to like faint. IBDs are known to feature a complex interaction between exposure to environmental factors, a person's genetics, their immune system function, and the composition of their gut microbes. Urbanized environments are known risk factors for both, while smoking is an additional risk factor for Crohn's. Both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are conventionally thought of as incurable, chronic autoimmune diseases in which the person's immune system automatically attacks various parts of their digestive tract. This causes inflammation that can lead to permanent damage in the body. Three out of four Crohn's patients will require surgery. Crohn's can occur anywhere in the digestive tract, from mouth to anus, while ulcerative colitis only occurs in the large intestines. Powerful, anti-inflammatory and immune-suppressing drugs are used to suppress a patient's immune system. As a side effect, patients are susceptible to infections because of their weakened immune system. To prevent and treat infections their immune system can't fight off, patients are put on antibiotics. However, the antibiotics can weaken the health of the gut microbiotic community, which then allows Clostridium difficile to flourish, which is becoming an increasingly difficult and life-threatening problem that causes further diarrhea, weight loss, and malnutrition. Doctors and patients often struggle for years to find a treatment regimen that helps them reclaim a sense of normalcy and control of their health. These are years of a person's life where they're in and out of hospitals, feeling like a burden on their friends and family, and sometimes not even able to work. The trauma of it all is enough to drive one to depression and thoughts of suicide. And then after that, I guess you could say I went home the next two days and it was a pretty depressing two days. And I've mentioned in some of my other videos that I definitely felt like committing suicide when somebody tells you to have Crohn's or colitis. I never would have taken my own life, but I wanted to die. And I thought if I could just go to sleep and not wake up, that would be okay because this is no way to live. You know, you, you grieve loss of family, but there's also grieving the loss of potential future. And there's a grief process there. As we started reading more about Crohn's disease and everything that was involved with it, we realized this isn't just a, you know, you're, this is the rest of your life. This isn't going away. Uh, and so I was, you know, angry it was again the why me questions a good chunk of chunk of what i'm going to be doing is managing this this disease i think in the beginning when i was trying the allopathic pathway i was in such pain that i would sit at my desk and literally bend over and in pain and sweating and breathing and then somebody walked by my office door open and sit up and act like i'm okay and then as soon as they walk by again just fall back over and put my head on my desk. We started looking through a book, which was like just a book at first to like figure out what was wrong with the computer, but then it turned into like like a Williams Sonoma book or whatever. And um, 
we're looking through and they go, oh, I like that. And I go, oh, yeah, that's oh, my stomach. Okay, so I finished all my supplement list, which is here. They sat me down and explained, you know, we're going to put you on prednisone. That was one night I was launching out of bed because I thought there was a man coming in our room to kill us. And I woke up in mid-swing across the room, uh, and it freaked me out so much that I got up and checked the whole house. When they finally said, okay, we're going to put you on this other drug and start tapering you off, it was kind of a relief. So every time I took the Emuran, anywhere from an hour to two hours after I took it, I was on the floor with those shakes, the fever, and I was retching, throwing up, nasty. It was worse than when I had the flare-up without medication. And so then they got me onto the Emuran, uh, which again worked, I guess, about six months. And then that's when they decided, let's do a Humira. Black box warning, which I think was, that came out about a year later after I'd already done this, taking a little bit of Humira and then uh, Imuran, there was an overlap there. And then about May, I started, the pain started coming back. You know, I, I knew Remicade was there. I knew that for several years and I was trying everything to avoid that because I knew what it entailed. I knew that even though it worked for a lot of people, that many people became allergic to it after time. I knew that it could induce systematic lupus. I knew that it could cause um, cancer in some in some instances, especially people who were already on 6MP, which I was at the time. It really terrified me, and I was doing everything I could to put it off. And I knew the chances, and I remember us laying in, in and laying down together in Hawaii, and we were talking, and she was like, "You just you want me to get you know this cancer?" And I said, "I've had cancer. Don't say that to me." I said, "But I will say this to you: I would rather." I mean, I'm in tears. I'm saying this to her. I said, "I would rather you have a life for 15 years, and you know, get married and be a mom and have all the dreams. You realize all the dreams you want. If it gave you 15, 20 years, I would rather be burying you then than burying you now." you don't have a life right now. You know, I, I can't bear to see you go through this. Um, let them make an appointment for you for the Remicade. And I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I have to tell someone who's 30 years old to hook up to this medication. I really am. I just, I just can't. I, it's, it's a real struggle for me to watch you spend these very important years in your life being ill. And It was almost like not an out of body experience, but I could hear myself talking to myself and I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, I've got to do something. This isn't working. I have no other option. I have to take something. I don't think it's going to work, but what am I going to do? All these, this cycle of thoughts over and over. And I was so sick and I just remember like hearing my voice kind of appear and it was like a whisper and it said, you're dying. And, and, I, and then I said back to that voice, I know. And I just, I remember coming out of the bathroom after that particular time and, I, and my parents were there and I said, okay. I said, I said, I'll go, you know, I'll take whatever I have to take. And that was the point when I just knew that um, I had to do something even if I didn't believe it was the right thing. And I had to give in at that point and surrender. I'm tired of the guilt and I'm tired of the pressure I 
No, I can't go back, but I don't know what to do Because I wanna be free I so wanna be just like me I went and had the third one and a few weeks later nothing like the bleeding was still there everything was still there it it didn't work at all and at that point my doctor said you know I'm really sorry but there's nothing else I can do for you besides surgery and when those drugs didn't work it put me over the edge and I was like first I can't live like this I'm not living I don't have enough energy to engage with my family I don't have enough energy to work to climb a flight of stairs I'm on the floor retching. What kind of life is this? So at this point, I had bled off and on for like three and a half years, and nothing helped it. Not the Remicade, not the TPN, not any of the drugs um, helped it at all. I become completely frustrated with hospitals, you know, and with with the care that I received. Um, you know, I had some great doctors, some caring doctors, but they did not help me at all. You know, they were unable to help me in my condition. They only made me worse. So I asked the doctor, I said, what's the next other option? He said, there aren't, there aren't any right now. Your clinical trials are probably your best option. And so that's when I started looking at other alternatives. As explained earlier, most doctors and researchers treat IBDs as though an overactive immune system needs to be suppressed by drugs. Sometimes that's necessary in dire situations. What if there existed a theory on the causation of IBD that could lead us towards possible treatment approaches that heal the root cause? For example, let's look at the biome depletion theory. It says that as humans evolved, we did so within an environment that was teeming with life, plants, insects, animals and microbes surrounded early humans, especially the microbes. The microbes colonized every nook and cranny, both inside and outside of the human body. The natural environment in which we evolved helped to diversify our intestinal microbiome. This diverse intestinal microbiome developed mechanisms to communicate with our immune systems so that the two could work together symbiotically. This prevented the western inflammatory conditions that plague many today. As we became more technologically advanced, we cut down the trees and replaced them with buildings. The insects and animals all scurried away to find new homes. We covered the dirt with asphalt. We stopped eating nature's offerings and starved the microbes within. Antibiotics gained popularity in the early 1900s, and recent research is demonstrating that many IBD patients have different compositions of microbiota in their guts compared with healthy subjects. Antibiotics may play a contributing role in this difference. The earliest triumphs of the field of microbiology involved identifying um, uh, pathogenic bacteria that were vectors of disease. You know, we have all grown up with this, uh, uh, you know, world view that bacteria are bad and, um, you know, to the extent that we can, we should try to kill them uh, or even eradicate them. And so it's the ideology, but then it's also the, you know, the chemical warfare that's um, uh, playing out in our bodies every day from, you know, antibiotics that, you know, we might be prescribed, but even if we're not prescribed them, we're all ingesting low levels of them in our water every day. They're the antibacterial cleansing products that we're being seduced into buying and, you know, washing our bodies with, washing the surfaces of our homes with. It's the chlorine that's put in water precisely to kill bacteria. So so it's all of this chemical exposure we have on a daily basis that subjects the um, you know, bacteria in our bodies that are so uh, critical to our functionality to daily assault. The use of toilets in the 1930s started a health revolution that dramatically decreased infection of helminths, which are microscopic worms that have been shown to be anti-inflammatory in the intestines. With their eradication, in the general population came a rapid rise in inflammatory conditions such as Crohn's disease and colitis. The food we eat is highly processed to clean and strip the food of its natural biodegradable properties. This processing of food is an effort to make it safer and last longer on store shelves, but it presents a couple of problems. One, our bodies are not introduced to a wide variety of microbes normally found on natural food. These microbes cannot colonize and train our immune systems to function properly. Second, the processed food is lacking in fiber and doesn't feed the microbes what they need to grow and provide anti-inflammatory chemicals for us. Without the healthy microbes, we are left vulnerable to pathogens causing inflammation. 
Because of the destruction of the natural environment and our isolation from it, processed food, overuse of antibiotics, and the use of toilets, people are less exposed to microbes than ever before. Our environment and bodies are lacking many beneficial microbes that strengthen our immune systems and keep us healthy. This weakness in our immune system leaves us vulnerable to conditions such as asthma, psoriasis, obesity, autism, and inflammatory bowel diseases. This is the biome depletion theory. On September 9th, 2009, I received a package in the mail that contained hookworm larvae, and I infected myself with them. So the trip out of the country was kind of a combo, you know, get infected with hookworms and celebrate our marriage, so, <laughs> you know, because those go together. <laughs> How romantic. Right. <laughs> It would have cost us about a hundred dollars for shipping, um, whereas now we're spending, you know, over a thousand to you know to get out of the country, and then get back into the country just just for a treatment. So I decided to take the five thousand I use of the vitamin D, and by the next day when I looked in the toilet, there was like half the bleeding, which was like amazing to me. I took another 5,000 the next day, and like by the third day, I would say, my bleeding stopped completely and never came back. All these super drugs, all of the stuff that they had tried to give me, um, all the things I had tried on my own to try to get this to stop, and just by chance, I take, I find out about vitamin D3 and I took it, and it never returned after that. And that gave me more. Um, incentive to go on and continue to I, to look for alternatives even though I had already gone through a lot of them you know I was still open because that's the only thing that made sense to me at that point and we took the bar to San Francisco to uh, his office for the first 45 minutes he asked me to just tell me since childhood what has my health been like? You know, what series of events have happened? And he drew these diagrams um, with my mom and I, and he explained to me exactly what was going on in my body. The inside of the bowel, from basically the mouth down to the anus, is a layer of villi, which I sometimes draw, but it's like hair-like projections uh, from the inner lining of the bowel sort of like this, little hairs that protrude into the, into the inner part of the bowel, in so-called lumen. And on top of that is a layer of good bacteria, um, actually billions of bacteria of hundreds of different strains. And below that is the muscular layer. And I tell people as an analogy to think of it like soil and grass. So the villi are like the soil, and on top of that is a layer of grass, which is the microbial sort of gut flora. And if you think of it like a meadow, if there's a healthy soil and healthy grass, then life is good for the meadow. But if you come along and strip the grass uh, off the meadow, especially if it's a hilly meadow, you will get erosion of the soil until it gets to the subsoil, which is the muscular layer of the intestines. And that's pretty much the same process that happens in us. So what happens if you don't get good bacteria when you go through the, through the birth canal, or if you take an antibiotic, or if you don't go into the care and feeding of our healthy gut ecology by eating cultured food, etc., then you have a, a bad grassy layer, and then the villi get eroded, and just like the soil, you get cracks in the soil, and then stuff starts seeping into the groundwater, which in our case is the blood. And then the difference between the soil and the gut, the gut and the gut flora, which is the key to the GAPS diet, is in these 
uh, little villi is an enzyme made called disaccharide aces. Disaccharide aces digest disaccharides. So as you lose your gut flora, which is your immune system, as the villi get eroded, as stuff seeps into your groundwater, which is the blood, you lose the ability to make this enzyme and then you can't digest disaccharides. And if you keep eating them, they form food for abnormal gut flora, yeast, fungus, clostridia, etc., which then colonize the gut wall, which is like bad grass or crabgrass, and that makes worse protection, which makes more erosion, which makes less disaccharidases, which makes worse ability to digest. And that is the vicious cycle that was described in the book, Breaking the Vicious Cycle. And he then prescribed me um, some pertinent, um, some key supplements. And then he also prescribed the GAPS diet. When I read the book, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's book, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, I was blown away. I was fascinated because for the first time, I could see exactly how this happened to me. Well, I had already been perusing the peer review to learn about my condition so that I could talk peer to peer with my doctor about the drugs. I was learning about the drugs, reviewing New England Journal of Medicine, anything I could get my hands on. And um, I stumbled on the SCD and I didn't know if it was credible or not. And I didn't know if I wanted to start it. Well, if these drugs work, then I can live my normal life. The SCD is pretty restrictive. I did a lot of research. I followed some of the, a bunch of the references in Elaine's book and figured that it was at least credible enough and I was at least um, not working in anything else. What else do I have to lose? The next step is Remicade, which I wasn't going to do um, on principle, and surgery, which I also wasn't going to do. I was at the point where I'd rather it kill me than go to some of those places. Did you have kind of like a, a last supper before you switched over to uh, a CD, anything like that? I did. Okay. Well, I didn't have a last supper per se, but I had a week of what I call dietary hedonism, where like, if it feels good, do it. And I, I ate whatever I wanted, even though it would send me into, into the bathroom. I remember eating a celebratory Subway sub and I, a 12 inch, pile it as high as I could with everything and just enjoy the heck out of it. Really GAPS is more of a protocol. I don't like to call it a diet. Number one, I think it's a lifestyle. Number two, um, it's a protocol because it works in a synergistic effect because you've got detoxing, you've got therapeutic foods, and you're also eliminating bad foods that you know you can't digest. So you know, you're eliminating the complex carbohydrates, which are a problem for people with GAP syndrome because they're not being digested. I use raw milk and I make raw milk kefir, which has been just insanely good for me. Like as soon as I started it, like last year, um, I got the real kefir grains from a friend and um, those just skyrocketed my health. You're really doing everything to aid your body to heal and it works in a synergistic effect and it's just a phenomenal diet um, for healing and not just Crohn's disease, just all kinds of things, which is really powerful and really amazing. It took me a couple of months uh, to get started and um, in the meantime I just kind of skating by you know like I was all the other months you know still feeling very sick and I started in the intro diet no dairy for six weeks on intro and I did that but then by the I would say month three or so I thought you know I, I really think that that I could be healing like I feel pretty okay and I feel better than I felt you know I wasn't symptom free but I felt better than I felt in a long time I felt stronger um, I wasn't having the bleeding still, still. And I've been almost four months on gaps. And why is today um, noteworthy? Today is noteworthy because I'm eating fruit for the first time. This is a stewed apple, and we put a little butter in there and a little salt. So this is your first taste of fruit in four months. It's really good, nice and soft.
I kept thinking, well, even if this is working, is it going to work for a while? And then like, I'm going to be sick again. I'm going to have a flare in a few months. You know, I kept thinking that. But by seven months, the evidence was there and I felt great and I was symptom free. And I thought, no, this is the real deal. Four days after I started the SCD, I noticed a change when I was tracking my symptoms. I noticed a positive change and I got excited. It, I was guarded still because even on the medications I'd had good, a couple good days here and there and I was like, woohoo, I'm healed! And then the next day, you know, I'd go to the bathroom 12 times and get really depressed about it. So I was excited yet guarded. Still was experiencing pain um, and it really wasn't, you know, I woke up one January morning and said, oh look, I'm fine. It was, you know, about two weeks after the fact, I looked back and I started noticing Basically, they have the, the pain levels. I could look at the status of that and looking back at the trends over the, the days, and I started noticing less and less pain. And I, it suddenly clicked with me wait, I haven't had pain. Uh, you just kind of you only know, notice it when you have it, you know. And so um, I, I started checking, looking at the, the bowel rates, and those were kind of in decline um, to the point where it was basically one to two a day. And then after a month, I noticed that I was down to, I think, I can't remember exactly how many times, maybe five-ish times a day from 12 to 24. And so I had enough data by the end of a month or six or seven weeks to go to run a, a t-test on the stuff that I did and show my doctor, look, this is a significant change. <laughs> and in natural systems, like what's going on, the the statistics are amazing. Mm -hmm. With the hookworms, uh, it took about four months before I really started seeing uh, decreased bowel uh, movements, uh, less pain, um, and before I was really certain, okay, this is, this is working. In November of 2004, I had a CT scan from my gastroenterologist, and he found that I was getting strictures in my ter terminal ileum, that there was some thickening and scar tissue forming. I was getting what's called partial bowel obstructions, and these were incredibly painful for me. I had to reduce my diet, I had to remove foods like spaghetti squash, um, strawberries, uh, pepper, carrots, because the very fibers would get blocked in my intestines because my intestines was narrowing a little bit and getting smaller, and then the food just couldn't get through. I knew the stats, and I knew that about 75% of patients that have Crohn's disease end up having surgery because of the scar tissue that, that can form. And I didn't want that, I was super scared of that. Uh, and so from January through the middle of April, I actually had more days of no pain, consecutive no pain, than days with pain. And so I felt like it was I was finally starting to turn a corner. The only thing that had changed was the helmet, the, the helmets, um, the hookworms. About a month ago, uh, from that fluoroscopy, we found that I had an 11 inch stricture that was about an eighth of the normal size uh, of your small intestine. So the small intestines is supposed to be about uh, an inch and a half in diameter, uh, so an eighth of that works out to a small pen or a drinking straw. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously they said at that point I needed to, to have surgery because my, my gastro is, is suggesting that I get on Remicade, which scares me. <laughs> I mean, buying a year or two of good of no pain isn't worth cancer down the road. Living with the constant pain. Um, and realizing that it's, it's gone too far for any other kind of treatment to, to repair and understanding it's only a small portion. Uh, I'm kind of hopeful um, and because I know that I may have a possible cure with with my helminthic therapy. And so my goal is to, I mean, hit it hard with, with everything that I've got that's not going to cause cancer, <laughs> you know, 10, 15 years from now. And so I decided to see a naturopathic doctor and ask if she had any ideas on what I could do on a more natural basis to treat my partial bowel obstructions. 
and she recommended that I try glutamine, which is, in a way, it's the food or fuel for the small intestinal cells, and it helps keep the cells really healthy and flexible, the way she described it. I took it for several months, and then I tried eating strawberries again, which I knew were a trigger food for me, and I felt fine. I felt okay, and it was really amazing. And over time, I realized that glutamine was really helping me, but it wasn't a cure. When I met Jay Balak, he heard about me having trouble with partial bowel obstructions. So he showed me his colloidal silver uh, machine, which makes it, and I tried um, the colloidal silver that he made at home. Ever since that day when I tried it, um, I have not had any partial bowel obstruction pain at all. There's tons of information out there on the internet saying that you'll turn blue. I don't want it to happen, so I'm not going to drink it on a daily basis. I have been on this medication, which is called 6MP, so I've been on this for over three years. This is a, a really heavy immunosuppressant. And today, I get to take my very last one ever. Yeah, and I hate taking this medication because it always suppresses my immune system. So um, it just doesn't make any sense if you're sick that you should suppress your immune system. But I had to take it when I was my sickest and because there weren't really any other options. But then you just can't stop taking it cold turkey. So you have to wean off of it and wean off of it. And so okay. we find more grams. There okay. we go. This is it. Last one. Ta-da! Okay, congratulations, honey. Thank I'm you. proud of you. You've never once swayed, uh, swayed from the diet, and um, you're reaping the rewards now. I'm free! Yay! God bless you. I've also tried THC oil, or Rick Simpson oil. And what that is, is that's just highly concentrated THC oil from cannabis. And when I first tried it, or every time that I've tried it, I've just had kind of a, a pin prick uh, drop of the oil. And I've put it on my tongue and uh, went to bed soon afterwards. The main thing I don't like about it is that I get groggy for several days afterwards. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't, I'm not very productive. On the flip side, I can eat whatever I want for five days straight and not even worry about it. No pain, no gas, no diarrhea. It's like a superpower with consequences after using it. <laughs> Zachary's Pizza because I'm celebrating one year and one month on GAPS and I'm going to try illegal food. So this is your first illegal full meal in a year? Yes. I can feel all of the gluteomorphines in my body making me sleepy. I want to lay down. If anyone, you know, thinks that their case is too far gone, like, I would just say don't believe that because it looked like there was no hope for me. You know, it looked like there was nothing else. I know that there's healing for Crohn's. After I had interviewed with Tara Rosas, I really wanted to try the Gut and Psychology Syndrome Protocol. So what I found most beneficial has been the fermented foods, like kefir and kombucha. I treat them as my medicine, so nobody messes with them except for me. And it's just been really, really ph phenomenal and really exciting. Uh, to see how beneficial they've been for me. In the winter of 2012, I decided that I felt healthy enough 
and strong enough that I wanted to try and play ice hockey again. And I hadn't played in over 12 years. So here in Eugene, Oregon, we have a adult hockey league, recreational, and I joined and started playing and it was pretty amazing. It kind of felt like I hadn't stopped playing in 12 years. Just so rewarding to be able to overcome my Crohn's and to be able to have a physical, something that's a lot more tangible to see like, yeah, I definitely have overcome my Crohn's. I'm able to play now when in the past I couldn't play. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you said I would never do it, but look, now I'm doing it. I was running in uh, the woods two Sundays ago, three Sundays ago, and I started to picture myself running this marathon, which I never thought I would do, right? I started to picture myself finishing, and then I started to run faster and faster because I got all this energy, and then I started to cry. I, I just started to cry because I never thought that it would happen again. Everybody told me that this is a life sentence, and I don't feel like it's a life sentence because now I went from 12 to 24 times a day. I go once or twice a day now, and it's it's almost completely normal. Not quite yet, but it's almost there. Here, I want to ask you a question. No, no, I would not do it. You wouldn't do what? I would not. Whatever you're talking about has to do with poop. <laughs> I would not. It just, I just need to that borrow. That crosses the boundary. I just need to borrow a little bit of your healthy ecology. And. <laughs> I mean, we kiss, right? <laughs> okay, if you want to dig my dookie out of the toilet, be my guest. <laughs> it just makes it up. I want it. nothing to do with it, and I don't want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, so family members can share everything except their own do. Right. That's the well, point. you could just, you know, make an arrangement for her just to not flush the toilet and then she'll never know what happened to the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fecal matter therapy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'd probably try it one day. Why not? What are fecal transplants? Fecal transplants, also called human microbiota transplants, do just that. They transplant donor stool from one healthy person into a sick person. Donor stool contains trillions of gut microbes. Research shows that patients with IBDs have compositions of gut microbes that differ from healthy people. The transplants change the composition of gut microbes in the sick person to resemble the compositions of gut microbes in the healthy person. It is not unlike an organ, bone marrow, or other human tissue transplant. In fact, researchers consider the human gut microbiome to be an organ, and it's one of the hottest areas of medical research today. HMTs could radically change the treatment course for IBDs, away from symptom management to curing the root cause. In some cases, that is already happening, underground, without the full support of medical doctors, because the FDA currently regards HMTs as a drug that is yet to be fully researched. The FDA restricts the use of HMTs by doctors to only treat Clostridium difficile in cases that have failed antibiotic treatment. In the treatment of Clostridium difficile, HMTs have been 90% effective. But in IBD patients, they don't have years to wait for the research to prove what they believe can give them their lives back. IBD patients who opt to use HMTs have no choice but to either do them at home without doctor assistance or pay thousands of dollars to travel for treatments in Australia, Argentina, or Mexico. The FDA regulations and high costs of treatment are driving many patients to do them at home. Matt Robinson did his treatments at home before the FDA restrictions went into effect. But his story is an example of what many patients are facing because they are without access to medical professionals who are allowed by the FDA to perform HMTs. Finished the antibiotics last night at seven o'clock was the last dose. And then now um, to finish cleaning the colon of any residual bacteria and fecal matter, which hold the bacteria, 
you have to do a colonoscopy prep or a full lavage. Just gotta drink this okay. huge, massive thing of laxative. Dumbledore, they got like this uh, bowl of potion that, that he has to drink in order to get down there. And he says, Harry, you've got to make me drink this potion. This potion might paralyze me. Might make me forget why I'm here. Might cause me so much pain that I beg for relief. You are not to indulge these requests. It's your job, Harry, to make sure I keep drinking this potion. Even if you have to force it down my throat. I can't believe you just did that. Ugh, it's not. It's not awesome, but it's not as bad as the last one I did. Oh, really? For the last colonoscopy. biggest fear is that it just won't work at all or actually bigger than that is that the antibiotics combined with um, a fecal transplant therapy that didn't work will make me worse off so if Crohn's can be a progression from indeterminate colitis have I just eased that progression for myself Here, I'm done. I'm 100% a man, and I have fun by myself. My health increases, self defeating thought processes have been deleted. Okay, I'll be back. That was positively the most disgusting thing I've ever done. Really? <laughs> Preparing that, but uh, I mean, it, when it went in, I couldn't even feel it. Like I didn't know that she was doing it, and we put the whole the whole thing. thing. Okay. So. And I, so you're sorry. Go ahead. I don't feel urgent or anything right now. So. Okay. Um, I started, I've done four infusions now, and it started to get better before I ate the rice. And then I had diarrhea from the rice. So now I'm sort of recovering from that. And it was still, it was loose this morning in the, in the stool. And it was probably what I would consider diarrhea, but it wasn't anything what it was yesterday. So it's really frustrating that I seem to have set myself back with the rice. But I had to try it, and uh, I still have six or 12 more infusions I can do. And my donor is on board, he'll do it for as long as I want to do it. You read like anecdotal things that people say, oh, I got better after one infusion. And, and I got that in my mind that that was gonna be it for me. And, and it hasn't been that way. And it hasn't been that way for any treatment I've tried, period. So maybe I just have the most persistent case of colitis in, that I've ever read about, <laughs> but. Um, so that's been a little bit disappointing and mentally I struggle with, um, wow, what if all, what if this doesn't work either? You know, mentally, am I going to be able to continue on, continuing on with different things or is this just going to, at some point, I feel like just throwing up my hands and who knows. So this morning I felt that way after I had diarrhea, I felt like, like, ah, forget it. Why am I doing this? But for every one of me, there are just countless thousands that are suffering, being cut open on horrible drugs, you know? Because you're just based on an assumption that this dude or this dudette went to school and they went to school for 10 plus years and then they know what they're doing, right? But just because they went to school and they did what I guess the system taught them, no, that doesn't mean necessarily the system has the best track record and knows what it's doing, you know what I mean? 
I was prescribed medications like antibiotics and Accutane that have severely damaged my, my intestinal health and my gut. There's been all these lawsuits from other patients with inflammatory bowel disease against Hoffman and LaRoche, who is the maker of Accutane, which is a drug that I took. And I also have inflammatory bowel disease. So these drugs are not uh, safe. I don't feel like they're safe at all. Let's just take the facts in. Most people do not overcome their Crohn's, their Crohn's or colitis. You know? They're not overcoming it because the approach isn't working. The allopathic medicine, traditional Western medicine, excels at traumatic intervention. Car wrecks, heart attacks, those sort of traumatic interventions they do really well at, but they don't do much at keeping people healthy. But people aren't looking and they're not asking those questions, they're just going to their doctor and doing what their doctor says. I don't think the solution lies in changing the medical establishment because what I've seen of the way this world works it's all about money. And I think it's not right that people are told that there's no cure for this disease. So there's no precedent for cures, you know? We're living in a society that has no cure for any disease. Come on. But in regards to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, they're not being held accountable, because point blank, what have they cured? So is it in their best interest? And anybody watching this, you have to look into your heart and say, is it in the pharmaceutical company's best interest to cure you? Well, if they don't, if they cure you, well, they just lost the revenue stream. You know, when the medical system doesn't have a replacement and then your government doesn't let you find something on your own, it's just frustrating. The organization that was supposedly created to help us and keep us safe is now the, the, the organization that drove us out of the country <laughs> to go find hope. Once the anecdotal evidence piles up high enough, it, it requires attention. It just yeah. requires attention. I mean, the, the cure is going to be found within patients. And even short of the cure, successful treatments are going to be found in patients, right? Like, the patient is the laboratory in which the discoveries are going to be made. Why is the information from patients not respected or not um, listened to? Yeah, so yeah, having Crohn's has taught me that we have a really big problem in healthcare right now, in medicine right now, that patients aren't learned from. Like, patients will go through a bunch of different experiments on themselves, they'll do a bunch of different treatments, and literally the doctor is not functioning as a learning mechanism, right? So your, your doctor is, is more of a technician or, or maybe more of a teacher, uh, someone that can tell you what this one system knows. With autoimmune conditions like Crohn's, we're in the situation where we have a condition that's completely incurable and has a huge impact on people's lives. And it's really poorly understood by medical science. And so you, it's, it seems so backwards to like literally the people that have the condition, the people that are trying these treatments are the end nodes. It takes 17 years for a medical discovery that, has, that can actually change the way we should treat patients to get widely disseminated in practice uh, for doctors, right? And that's 17 years of people losing body organs, you know, losing their intestines, passing away, um, and having you know, permanent physical damage to their bodies, right? That 17 years should be one year, it should be six months. It should be no time at all. As soon as we have a validated, a validated cure or a validated treatment, it should be available for people to do. Patients that are trying treatments should be able to disseminate that knowledge in the same way that the you know Wikipedia is used to disseminate encyclopedia knowledge, or or social media streams are used to disseminate revolutions or or learnings from the front lines of of really important political situations. Right? We have this huge potential, and and our system is completely backwards to stifling it, and so. 
because of Crohn's, I, I've been able to identify that, and that's what's brought me to be building Chronology. My goal for it, my vision for Chronology, is to be able to connect all of these patients with one another using information technology, using software, and using websites. As soon as we find out that a treatment is working for people, that, that knowledge can be spread throughout the world so that we minimize the, the time that people are in pain and the time that people are, their bodies are on the line. Yeah. You know, we have this map here of all the patients on the service. And they're all over the country already and growing across Europe, parts of Asia, parts of South America, Australia. And the goal is, what, what is the power, what is the potential of everybody teaching each other about the experiments they've done on themselves um, through treatments? And so one of the major features is health tracking. And this is actually my real health tracking here. And I keep sort of a log of foods that I've eaten. I keep a log of treatments that I've tried. And our goal is for this, this tracking to then feed into sort of a database of understanding. And so that database looks something like this right now, which is literally, we take all of the treatments that people have tried and we learn what are the most popular treatments. Um, you can see Remicade, Humira, Sandimmune, Asacol, Prednisone, Imuran. These are all listed just based off of um, the sort of treatments that people have tried on the site. And we can do the same for supplements. We can check out all these supplements, look at the most current user. Um, vitamin D, multivitamin, probiotics, B12, fish oil, calcium, iron. These are the most popular um, supplements that people use. And so I think it, it really changes how we practice medicine. It says, what if we connect patients with one another so that they can learn from each other as opposed to being sort of divided and conquered, you know? We're trying to solve this, how can we heal ourselves? But we're also trying to solve emotional connection between patients. The, I think one of the biggest problems right now that we face is that patients with these chronic conditions are disconnected by default. You walk around, you can't see and notice visually from a lot of these people whether they have Crohn's or colitis. And so the only way that you would get to connect with them is through some sort of created or sort of contrived situation of like, hey, oh, my friend also has Crohn's, this person has colitis, let's get you together, let's connect you. And I think those sort of spontaneous connections don't happen enough. And I think that if we can provide a safe environment on the web where people can do this in a private community, then it completely changes the potential for learning from patients. You out there as a patient are living at this really, this really amazing period in, in healthcare um, where you're literally on this cusp of what I think is going to be a completely radical change. You have the potential to take your patient experience now and make that a part of finding a cure. And what I hope we're doing is I hope we're literally moving from this paternal system of healthcare to one that's, that's a patient-centered version of healthcare. And, and if you, I encourage you to, to rise up and, and seize the reins, um, to, to get involved with other patients, to help share what treatments have worked with you with other patients. And um, literally, I think this is a period of time that will go back down into, into medical history. So take part while you can. <laughs> You're lucky to be here right now. Because yeah. at the end of the day, anybody watching this video or myself, you know what? We're not strong as just one person, but we're strong as a team. And if everybody actually voiced their opinion and said, hey, you know what? We want to change. We want that cure. You know, and I think that's important because if we if we demand the change it will come you know but it's more or less who's demanding the change and if everybody thinks they're too small to make a change well that's the first mistake because i guess you'd say as a group or as a combined effort we're not small we definitely dominate we could change the system
after the surgery, uh, obviously I felt terrible immediately after my gastro doctor had advised me, um, you know, if you, if you don't do anything, uh, you're going to end up back into surgery. Uh, and so the, the medication they put me on uh, was Remicade. In addition to uh, Remicade, they put me on a B12 shot once a month because they, they removed my terminal ileum, uh, which is the portion in your small intestines where you absorb B12. In talking with uh, my gastro about adding uh, azathioprine into it, into the mix, um, you know, there's the warnings that people have had of anybody males under 29, uh, it can cause some bad, you know, death even. Um, and so I haven't had, you know, I've been in remission for, I guess, two years now. I'd describe my health today uh, probably the best I've been in a long time. Currently, I'm not doing helminthic therapy. When the FDA classified it as a drug and began intercepting uh, packages that were mailed to the U.S., uh, it made it very impractical, if not impossible, to get, get them. Let's see. I did that first round of 10 when you were there. I did some follow-ups. I did another round of five uh, about six months later and then six months after that I did another round of seven because I was going downhill so I just did seven treatment uh, infusions in a row and it puts me back on track every time I take it uh, and every time I take it I exit the treatment a little bit better than when I started so I have one um, solid well-formed bowel movement a day sometimes two I'm not scared that I might lose my bowels in the middle of the metro <laughs> you know so that inspires that's all sorts of freedom that I can have now that I don't have to worry about whether my bowels are controllable or not and living without that fear is such freedom it really is and it makes all the discipline and all the like tracking stuff and all the picking out foods and it makes it all worth it it totally awesome. makes it all worth it and the blending up poop in a blender it makes it all worth it today i am doing fantastic i'm still med free yeah i've not taken any more medication since um, november of 2010 so i'm really excited about that it feels really good to be med free I had made a decision in October of last year to go back to school and I'm currently studying to get my certification in um, holistic health counseling. In the beginning of all of this, I wanted to cure myself of Crohn's disease. So after all this time, after 10 years of experimenting and learning from other empowered patients, what have I learned? <laughs> Am I cured? No. I don't think I'm cured, but I've come to a point in my healing where Crohn's is only a minor inconvenience once in a while. I have not taken conventional IBD medication since 2007. I doubt that I'll ever need surgery, and I no longer fear my future with Crohn's. I feel as though I am in total control of it, and it lives with me, not that I live with it. Having Crohn's has been the greatest gift. It has forced me to mature and grow as a person. Here's what I've learned that may be of practical use for you or a loved one. For each patient who is able to regain some normalcy and predictability in their health, they have done what I call the 5R framework. The framework has the following five components. Remove, replace, repair, re-inoculate, and reconnect. The overall strategy is to heal the gut damage restore gut microbiota diversity and health, and reseal the intestines to stop leaky gut syndrome. The framework allows patients to decide which healing tools they need. As medical knowledge and technology changes, new tools can be introduced and old ones retired based on the patient's individual needs. To get the best results, empowered patients address each component concurrently. Patients need to customize each component but in general, here's what they have meant for me and the majority of the patients I see who regain their health. Remove grains, starches, refined sugars, additives, toxins, toxic people, and anything in life that stresses you. Replace your current diet with nutrient-dense food and key supplements. Ideally, the food is organic and wild-raised, free of drugs and hormones. Repair your intestines with low-dose naltrexone fermented foods, bone broths, 
key supplements such as L-glutamine or butyrate. We inoculate with non-starchy vegetables, fermented foods, probiotics, and microbiota transplants. Reconnect with your passions, your loved ones, life itself. Understand that often our greatest pain gives us our greatest gifts. Here's another thing that I've learned. IBDs are not lifestyle diseases. You are not to blame for how you have lived your life. These are diseases of culture. If the various symptoms of IBD are messages trying to tell us that something is wrong with our body, IBD itself is a message that something is wrong with our society. Technology and science are advancing so rapidly that we cannot evolve fast enough to keep up. The challenge we face today is to embrace the modern marvels around us without sacrificing our evolutionary lineage. We must learn to straddle between two worlds, the primitive world and the high-tech world. By embracing the primitive world, we honor our evolutionary biology and live in a way that best supports how our minds and bodies stay healthy. By embracing the high-tech world, we have greater access to information and become more empowered, not only as individuals, but as a culture. That is the challenge we all face. It's not easy, but no one ever said it would be. I know from my experience, it's worth it. It's worth it for yourself and the future of our culture. Trapped in my world Everybody always taken from me I give and I give But it's never enough You know, it sure doesn't feel like my destiny I used to be such a laid-back person I used to have a lot of peace in my life Long relaxing dinners and movies and concerts You don't know what you've got till you lose it, I guess Because I wanna be free I so wanna be just like me I'm wound up tight like a cobra Day after day grinds on relentlessly Guess I'm just a loser, not like you I'm tired of the guilt and I'm tired of the pressure I know I can't go back but I don't know what to do Because I wanna be free I so wanna be just like me I'm wound up tight like a cobra Day after day grinds on relentlessly You say I should accept this life Stop fighting against it, it'll be alright But you don't know this is not who I am I gotta keep searching, gotta get a plan Because I wanna be free I so wanna be just like me I'm wound up tight like a coat Day after day grinds on relentlessly I wanna be free I miss myself so bad I can hardly breathe I'm wound up tight like a cobra Day after day, yeah, it sucks to be me My life, do you hear me? It's non-stop I'm on top of my premises, I keep my promises Pretense never is necessary I have my own goal, my own vision I take control, take a hold of my life Hold it tight like a knife Slip the jugular of motherfuckers who try to struggle against me Prevent me from execution I ring the world full of my pollution Turn the noise up, this boy has just been anointed The source of his own joy, step back let the story take you as these stored up forces Export my brain view on a daily basis 
baby, face it. Old me is gone, so don't chase it. I'm amazing, I'm still fucking awesome, grazing in the field. You feel this? You feel me? You hear this? You'll heal when you hear a man at the top of his game, unstoppable, running like a freight train. Are you afraid of brains that perceive the invisible systems that imprison individuals? You say they're invincible? I say that's inconceivable. I will make them perceptible and defeatable.